Tapelo, thank you so much for joining um, me for this interview um, and making the time. I know you have an extremely busy schedule um, there in New York. Um, I know the New Yorkers can be really running up and down with the <laughs> Starbucks coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so I really, I really appreciate you making this time um, to tell us a little bit about where you're at at the moment um, and share some thoughts. So for starters, I would just like to, to for you to introduce a little bit yourself. Um, what, where are you coming from? What is your background? Um, and where you're currently at, the journey that you're on. Well, uh, thank you so much, Marikin, for having me. I am, you know, very happy to be here and I'm so happy that you're doing what you're doing. I think it's a fantastic idea and I look forward to many more years and hopefully one day to be able to be part of this convention in, you know, in person. Um, with regards to my bio, my name is Tapelo Masita, as you said. I play the cello. I started playing cello in Bloemfontein a, in a program that you and I know very well, the Mangaung String Program. Yeah. Um, uh, we were at the music garden together and we had those years in the wonderful Free State. Uh, you <laughs> Although you, you, you were a little bit older, only a little bit, so I don't think Maybe I got to play in the orchestra of maybe one concert while you were there, but I don't yeah. think we, I, I, I... Yeah, we overlapped a little bit. Just a, a little, little bit, bit, a very little bit, yeah, because mm. then you went off to university and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, I come from that um, orchestral tradition in the Free State, um, mm. you know. Um, so after, you know, studying in the program, um, I started studying with Anne-Marie van der Westezen, whom we both know very well. Because yeah. I first was with Yefro Tilla and John Menard, and then I went to Anne-Marie, which was an, another incredible experience, a wonderful teacher. Yeah. She was the one that really, um, you know, opened my eyes to technical, to really high technical standards. Yeah. Um, and then after that, I sort of set my eyes towards the States. Um, a lot of people at the time um, were moving to Europe. And really, my, the only reasoning for me wanting to come to the States, I guess it was twofold, maybe threefold. Um, the first was I didn't want to be like everybody else and go to Europe like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> that was reason number one. <laughs> reason number two was because my cello teacher, Telayenkins, her kids had been to Interlochen mm. Arts Academy um, for high school mm. and for the summer festival. And um, she always talked so much about it. And I really wanted to experience that as well. And the third reason, uh, which perhaps may have been the one, you know, that tipped, you know, that tipped all things was because I was a huge fan of two shows when I was in high school. It was a TV show called Fame. And it was another, <laughs> it's a TV show called Fame. And actually, I have a funny story about that, and which I'll tell you. Uh, but it was because of that TV show and Gossip Girl um, that I decided I wanted to come to America. But funnily okay. enough, the Fame story, the Fame story is amazing because the lady who I started studying with oh. um, at Juilliard when I got there for my master's, she was, so Fame was filmed in, I think, around the 80s, okay, or late 80s. Mm -hmm. When Fame was being filmed, she was at LaGuardia High School, where the, where the show was filmed in New York what? City. So, you know, absolutely incredible, that show that led me to the United States. I end mm -hmm. up studying with one of, you know, the people who were on that same very campus as a student, sure. while it was filmed i think that's yeah that's that was incredible unbelievable um, <laughs> that that was the case. but when i when she told me about it because i she was asking me basically the same question how did you get to new york yeah, yeah. and oh i love this tv show called fame and she's <laughs> like oh you know 
when I was, when that was being shot, I was at the school, but they didn't let me be in the show because I was in grade seven and they only wanted the grade 12s in the movie. So she was a little bit unhappy about that, but <laughs> nevertheless, she was, she was part of that whole ecosystem when that was happening. Well, how long have you been in the States now? I came here in 2012, so this is my eighth year. I think eight yes. years and eight years and almost two months now. Sure. Yeah, and I arrived. In this. Oh, so are you study wise? So are you done with your masters? Are you busy with mm. your DMA or? Yeah. So when I got here, I went to Interlochen for one year to do their um, extra year of high school, just to get ready for university auditions. Just because I had no idea how on earth I would get into an American university. So that's the route that I took um, at the recommendation of my cello teacher. Um, and then after Interlock, and I went to Eastman oh. uh, with music with Stephen Doan, which was mm-hmm. a, another incredible experience mm-hmm. uh, for four years to do my bachelor's. Mm-hmm. And then I did my master's at Juilliard. And now I'm busy with my DMA at the City University of New York at their graduate center. Yeah, sure. Yo, that's amazing. It's really so it's awesome. been a while. It's been a while. So, and you, do you visit um, often or how, how do you, I mean, obviously now with the whole COVID-19 situation, it's, it's not possible, but do you get to visit at least once a year or so? Yeah, I mean, my general practice is to visit South Africa once a year. Yeah. Um, that's generally how I do it. Mm-hmm. But... Um, you know that's not uh, that that has not been possible this year and i don't i basically don't know when i'm going to be able to come home next because of all the covid stuff you know sure because i don't want to be in a position where um i try and go back home and then i cannot re-enter the united states no. because of their own guidelines i'm hoping that by i mean this is the first year that i've been in america for 12 months it's usually i'm in america for nine months and i go to south africa for three months yeah yeah. Uh, but this is the first time that i'm gonna i will have been in america for 12 months so i'm hoping um that by may or june next year during the summertime when school is closed on this side Mm. uh, hopefully that will be a long enough time for them to um allow us to go out and come back in. Yeah. 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 Um, now, speaking of COVID, um, you mentioned to me um, that you have students. What is your experience with online teaching? And did you experience specific difficulties having to explain certain things, certain techniques? Yeah, I mean, Online teaching has been, so first of all, I'm lucky because I live in New York where everybody has pretty good Wi-Fi. Mm. So, so connection with students wasn't as much of a problem as I would imagine it can be in other places, even mm. in the United States. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, um, but the difficulties have been, if any, I think the biggest have been trying to ensure that the student's setup is actually 100% correct. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, you know, apartments in New York are small and the ca- they can only put the camera in such and such a place. Mm. Um, then you as the teacher, you don't, you know, sometimes you don't get a full view of what actually the student is doing. Yeah. Um, I actually had a funny experience where one of my kids, one of my 10-year-old students, whom I've been teaching online, um, he was getting really sort of antsy with the whole like just learning and learning and not having any um, chance to perform. So I decided that, you know, we should do a recital. So in July, I want to say, no, August, early August, I want to say, we worked for a recital, which he did. And the recital, I said he will do a recital for his parents outdoors. Mm -hmm. Um, so the camera for the whole summer had been like, I'm viewing the kid's hands yeah. at a certain level. Uh, and everything looked fine. He was sounding fine on camera and everything like that. 
And then when I got to the live recital and I saw him for the first time in like five months, I looked at the kid's bow hold. I'm like, what happened to your bow hold? <laughs> Just because, you know, the bait of the camera made it look like the kid was fine. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> when, I, when we got there, I mean, the thumb was like, coming in like this and i was like why is the thumb coming oh yeah so that's, oh. My, that's my crazy covid teaching story <laughs> i'm sure <laughs> we i'm sure we all have some the thing is i think some students reacted differently to this whole situation um you know i had students that really excelled they it really worked for them and yeah. then I, I had some students that you know they really it just worked better for them to have in-person lessons yeah so it's interesting this whole thing you think about wi-fi of course uh there are i mean if if the, the moment if there's a little cloud that goes over <laughs> you know the wi-fi just goes completely yeah so I also want to ask you, do you um, get to play a lot of solo and chamber and uh, orchestra, like a combination of, of all three? Yeah, I mean, my life currently uh, seems to be developing as such that I am freelancing a lot in New York and I'm doing a variety of all those things. I mean, over the past year and a half, I'll say that I've been getting more solo engagements than okay. before. Then, okay. so that's something that I'm getting used to, and sort of getting used to like the pressure of having to do that and mm -hmm. somebody paying you money to go and play a Bach suite. You know, and, <laughs> you know mm -hmm. that's uh, things like that. I've been doing a whole lot more recital work. Um, I do a lot of stuff as well. I play with a lot of um, pop artists sometimes. I, oh. yeah, I, I, I got to play with Solange Knowles at Radio City Music Hall. Uh, I've done shows um, for the Jimmy Fallon, the Late Show with Jimmy Fallon, uh, that what? late night show. That's I so my life has been like not just um, you know classical music it's been a real variety of things um i do also early music as well i play Fantastic. good I, oh. I love that stuff um mm. actually you know my cello teacher in my undergrad stephen mm. doe mm. he sort of has this requirement for um his uh freshmen his first years and second years to play on gut strings at least for a while mm. because um you know how on steel strings, I, I mean, bass is probably a different animal, but like on steel strings, at least yeah. on violin. We're the elephant. Which, That's the animal. <laughs> <laughs> but we but, can be the swan too. <laughs> you, yes. Uh, especially when you're playing. I no. God. So, um, but um, yeah, he, you know, on steel strings, you know, you can sort of like play over the string and it's fine right mm. you don't really have to dig into the string so much but on gut strings you like if you try and go like this all you hear is scratch 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 mm. so so he uses that as a way to help develop students feeling of how Fantastic. like the string oh. like how to engage the string i think i i, I really think it's brilliant yeah. i i i think it has helped me and you know, I I notice a difference between people who are playing mostly modern but have had some experience on gut strings, mm -hmm. and people who've only ever played on steel strings. No. Um, I think it's a. It, it, I'm not saying one is better uh, than the other, but I'm saying that for sure, when as a string player you get experience playing on gut strings, um, it gives it adds more color adds more yeah. thing to, yeah. to 
to the palate. Yeah, know, no, I, 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 I agree with you. I really agree. That's with you. my view. It's, it's just, it's a pity that, well, I mean, I, of course, I understand why it's so expensive, but especially for bass gut, gut strings, mm. it's, it, it's really expensive. But I, I, yeah. I, I think it's, it's very good that he made, made you go through that process. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, uh, it was frustrating for sure in yeah. the beginning. Because no. I was like, I can't, cause I got to Eastman and you know, I did a good audition and I got into a good chair in the orchestra auditions on my steel strings. And then all of a sudden I went, I went to, from being in a position where like, oh, I think I can do this too. Wait, I don't even know how to make a sound. <laughs> no. You know, so that was a big lesson. So Pelo, if you look back now at your musical studies and musical career, um, I mean, we all learned lessons through through the years. Um, is there one specific lesson or, or um, advice that that you've you've learned over the past years um, from, especially also from being in the states for now for so long? One, I mean. I mean, I'm sure there's more than there's more than one, but if if there's like one, one or two, let's make it two. <laughs> well, I mean, I I'm guessing you're talking about sort of how a piece of advice that has gotten me through many things because I'm I'm I, it sounds like you're trying to get at whatever thing that has helped me get through challenges in the states living alone is that what is that where you were going with this well it can be either that or just for example um uh one thing that i i personally learned uh, from being in the states um is that you have to be connected you have to connect with your own you know players and sort of your own family um as in string family and um to try not to be sort of in your own bubble if, and yeah so just little advice things and it can be music of course to any music like studies related as well is there any specific piece that that really stood out for you while learning it? I mean, you just asked three more questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's start with uh, the, let's <laughs> So I'm gonna try and like give something a little general. I think if, you know, if anything, I, I, this, I have found it to be important in my life and in this experience that I'm having living out of my own home country, uh, I found it to be really important to sort of trust that voice brought you here in the first place. Mm. I think that that's a, I don't know, you can call it God, you can call it Krishna, you can call it Allah, call it whatever mm. you want. But I think we all have that voice inside of us that is guiding you and is helping you along. And I think it's important to trust that. And that also, I think it, it means you have to be brave enough to do so, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You have to be brave enough to, to trust who you know you are. I think that's very important. You have to really, it's very true, yeah. Over, yeah. Um, yeah. So that, and then, more practically speaking, um, I have found that very important to never be caught with your pants down and always be super prepared. <laughs> never be caught in a situation where, like, you were not prepared. You know, and. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely, I hear you. <laughs> um, 
and you know, I also about the voice, the inner voice, what you said about that, I also I, I agree with you. That's something you, it's almost like, you know, really listening to your gut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Actually, huh? if you don't know, may I ask you a question? Please, please. Go on, go on. I mean, since, since it, I mean, let's make this a conversation. Um, mm -hmm. What, I mean, you went back home, right? After you finished your doctorate here in, in the States. Mm -hmm. um, what was that experience like for you going back and plowing back, so to speak? Um, so I think in many ways, it was really good for me to to do sort of the go outside of the country and come back again because it really um it really brought sort of a maturity to, to my perspective on on many things just especially if you go to the states where everybody has everything you know access to wi-fi is just it's like having water coming from your tap it's, it's just it's normal you know and then you come here and it's it's not you know you you, you really sort of that sh sh shift even though i grew up here and i was you know um aware of all these things while i grew up but that go away for a few years and experiencing sort of having all that access and then coming back and then you know sort of seeing all these struggles it really really made me think about life differently um in many ways and yeah i i, I at the beginning when i came back it it took a while for me to adjust just as it took a while for me to adjust when i went to the states you know mm -hmm. With several things like people couldn't understand me because of my accent so um, but I'm I'm very happy that I did come back I think um, there's many different views on this and I've I felt differently about it also over the years um, but I'm now I think at the end it doesn't matter where you are I th you have to make the best of wherever you are um, and your happiness really it, it relies on that basically your attitude so yeah um yeah i think that is more or less my answer to that question um but Tapelo, i wanted to ask you what was the last question that i said i'm going to ask you you wanted to talk a little bit about technique and stuff like that. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, you you have a busy schedule, and as you mentioned, you have quite a few solo engagements. Um, is there any specific warm up techniques or technical exercises that you like to do regularly to sort of keep in shape? Well, <clears throat> I have, I have sort of. Like I organize my practice very carefully throughout the day. I'm especially when I have like a concert coming up. I and also at the same time I'm juggling my classes. Mm -hmm. So all my I'm lucky because my classes only start at ten in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I can like, but then all my classes are three hours long. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, the lectures are three hours long. It's tough. Um, but um so be, as a because of that i have to like make sure that i practice in the morning so like my morning practice is usually like my morning routine takes me about an hour and a half i know it sounds like a lot for just a warm up routine but that's that's what it takes me mm -hmm. um 
Um, so my non-negotiables in that time are all the things that I feel I need on a mm-hmm. daily basis okay. um, at the show in order to feel good, to feel mm-hmm. like I have the fingerboard under my hand. Mm-hmm. And those no, non-negotiables are, I do every morning, I, I do open strings <laughs> every morning. Mm-hmm. I start with like, literally, I, I start... Yeah, so with the metronome, metronome at 60, mm. open strings, you do first time four in a bow, then five mm. in a bow, so down and up, then five, then six, and I try to go up to 30 seconds, you know, 30 mm. count, 30 seconds, one bow, mm. 30 seconds, up bow, just to like get, and you do it along all the strings, you know. I... When I, when I do that exercise, I try not to put pressure on myself. If I can't make it to 30 seconds that day, it's okay. If, you know, <laughs> if my concentration lasts until I can get a beautiful sustained sound for 20 seconds, if that's all I'm getting today, you know, that's all I'm getting, you know. Right. And then I try not, because an exercise like that can drive you crazy, you know. Mm-hmm. But I think it, it's like it starts being therapeutic and then it drives you nuts. <laughs> so you have to do it during the time while it's therapeutic on all the strings and get a good sense of the sound of the cello. And then I, I like to do some little um, finger replacement exercises. These are all the things that I feel I need up and down just for intonation and things like mm-hmm. that. And then of course, um, I do scales. I like to practice scales for... Like if you if I get bored with like the sustained bow things, I like to practice um, scales with emotion, and oh. not just like do re mi fa sol la si do. Mm-hmm. Very mm-hmm. boring. Mm-hmm. I I like to. This is actually a thing I learned from my teacher at Juilliard to think about a character. Mm-hmm. Uh, think about uh, I don't know practicing. Uh, Mendelssohn, Midsummer Night's Dream, that type of character. Mm. And what key is that even? If A flat or E flat, something like that. And so, you know, that scares for the famous character. So you do that, you practice a scale in that character. Or you think Fantastic. about the character, oh. like your favorite piece, and you practice the scales in that key of that piece. You look at all the keys the piece goes through. I love those that, too. Those are the keys you're practicing in the character of those key areas in the piece. Yeah. That's an act. I, I think that's a fabulous character scale. Yeah. In a, and then you can also, at that stage, you, you, you have more options than just incorporating the rhythms that we are used to, that da 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 or da 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 or mm. da 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 da. You mm. find if the, um, for example, the second theme of Dvorak concerto, da la la di da di da. Okay, mm. so D major. I want to practice D major today in the character of the second theme of Dvorak concerto. So you sure. find, you know, and it's a bit becomes an improvisation and I think that's healthy yeah. and then uh, and then I my other non-negotiables are uh, scales in thirds and sixths yeah. and octaves for me those are like sort of everyday bread and butter no mm. questions asked you gotta do them suck it up kind of mm. but mm-hmm. because but with those but with those as well it doesn't have to be boring you know mm-hmm. um, so I do that, and so a lot of creative practicing. Yeah, yeah. Well, practice. If you're not being creative, I don't think you're practicing that well. Because practicing at its very core, in order to solve problems, mm. uh, you have to be creative. Yeah, so, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I really, I don't think practicing scales in like the da 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 da. da, da I don't think. I know that it is useful at the beginning stages, but as you get older, I'm not so sure that that kind of practicing of technical work mm. translates into your music making. Yeah. So I like to make sure that if I'm going to sit there and play a scale, 
it better help me with something you yeah. know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, no awesome um then last question and then i think we have to close it off um because i know you have to run off again um but would you advise a young person today to learn an instrument and not even specific string instrument but just an instrument or music and and why i think without a question you know anybody who has access to be to the opportunity to study an instrument and I think is a very, um, I think that's a very important thing for the development of the human being. Um, I think playing an instrument or playing music in general involves many things. Mm. You, at the, you know, at the basic level, it's sort of mastery of the self, getting you, getting yourself to do a specific thing with a specific goal like i want to play that d in tune mm. and that kind of you know that kind of thinking is something that translates into all your life you know yeah. i don't care if you want to be a doctor or anything mm. else but over and above that i think the practice of studying music is a huge I, this is going to get a little philosophical. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I think it's a huge act of empathy and trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Okay, Tapelo, what do you mean? So what I mean by that is um, when you learn a piece, right? Mm. Uh, you are looking at essentially the thoughts and efforts of another person who you've in many cases, at least at the student level, have most probably not met and will never meet because they're dead. Mm -hmm. So you are, it is immediately turning the gears in your mind of thinking about another person, what another person's life experience might have been, why another person might have decided to do what they're doing. You mm -hmm. see where I'm going with this? Yeah. It, 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 no. It's a training in... Well, like civility. Yeah. <laughs> you, look, you, you look at, you look at, um, I mean, my, my, my personal view is that, you know, as the world is developing right now, part of the manifestations of human madness, I think, is this inability to try and put ourselves in each other's shoes. Yeah. And I think... I think that the, you know, that studying an instrument at an early age, I don't know, I think can help with that. I mean, yeah. there are always going to be people who find it more difficult to put themselves in other people's shoes because of the environment in which they are learning an instrument. You know, mm -hmm. perhaps it's, it's all wealthy white kids that they're studying music with. Now we get into a conversation of, who gets to access music and how access can be diversified so that there can be a diversity of life experiences in which students can get used to trying to understand from an early age. Mm. So I think that that's, I think that that's the use of studying an, um, a musical instrument, regardless mm. of what you end up doing in your life. I think it, um, it, it can be, a, a guiding force for how humanity can interact at every level music mm. is like this yeah at every with regards to harmony you know it's like how these things are always interacting with each other i i, I really love your answer and i i i completely agree i think it's yeah it's it should be a necessity for all and all should have access to it I think, yeah, you know, everybody, you know, look, at the, we have to acknowledge the fact that people should first be able to survive. That is the yeah. first priority. Yeah, yeah. And, but when you get beyond surviving, um, you have to learn how to live with others. And no. I think music, I think music is, um, is a good way to learn that. And have fun at the same time. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, it's it's in connection with other human beings. Yeah, as, I mean, as you said, it's it's learn how to connect and you no. Know. Thank you so much for your time. Thank um, you. I I really appreciate it, and I really had an awesome conversation um, with you. And um, yeah, I hope all goes well, and that we we get get to see you here soon. And yeah, uh, I, I look I look forward to being back home. I mean, I miss yeah. South Africa. So, um, mm. Nothing is is quite as wonderful as that incredible country of ours i've been to many places but nothing can beat south africa yes no i hear you and the free state sunsets can we talk about free state sunsets <laughs> oh, yes <my> God. <laughs> nothing, nothing like it yeah nothing i hear like you it. i hear you